The Kraft Foods Company, makers of Kraft Quality Foods, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. When you're hungry for a taste that's rich and satisfying, or your recipes call for a cheese flavor that's really distinctive, here's the name to remember. Pabstet. Yes, Pabstet, the pasteurized processed cheese food that has that real cheddar flavor. That's right, the flavor you get in Pabstet is real cheddar, for it comes exclusively from fine cheddar cheeses of real distinction. You'll taste the difference the minute you taste Pabstet. You can get golden or pimento Pabstead in the handy-sized round package. But after you try it once, you'll want to buy it in a money-saving two-pound loaf. In any package, Pabstead is delicious. Ask for it tomorrow. Well, let's see what's doing with the great Gildersleeve. Today, his hometown of Summerfield is getting a preview of spring. And the water commissioner and his secretary are looking out the office window, getting a view of the preview. What a day, Bessie. Yes, sir. Sun shining like mid-July, and here it is only February 22nd. Yes, sir. Washington's birthday. Yeah. Too bad he didn't have a day like this when he crossed the Delaware. <laughs> it's as clear as a bell. Look, Bessie, you can see the bank. Yes, sir. I guess the employees are off today. It's Washington's birthday. I know, Bessie. <laughs> and look way off there to the right, Bessie. It's not often you can see the tack factory. I guess the tack factory is closed, too. It's Washington's birthday. I get the point, Bessie. Let's go through the mail, and you can take the day off. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. I was hoping you'd give me the day off. Of course, I didn't want to bring it up. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, let's see what we have in the morning mail. This looks like a letter from one of our... Satisfied consumers? Dear Commissioner Gildersleeve, we've intended writing you for some time. Well, because every time our faucet drips, we think of you. <laughs> Hecklers, remind me to answer this sometime, Bessie. I will, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'll make a note of it. What's this? Letter from Chicago. Office of the President of the Upstate Association of Businessmen's Clubs. Oh, that was addressed to the Jolly Boys Club, Mr. Gildersleeve, so the postmaster sent it to you. Oh, see. President of the Jolly Boys Club, Summerfield. Dear Mr. President... Are you president of the Jolly Boys Club, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, we've never elected a president. Let's see what it says. You are doubtless aware that our national convention has been set for March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Chicago. No, I didn't know that. This session promises to even top our last conclave held in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, see? Sounds pretty interesting. I've never been to Chicago. Neither have I. It's only recently that... I've never been to New Orleans either. Bessie. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's only recently that we compiled a complete list of clubs in your city, hence this belated invitation. Hmm. Writes a nice letter. Please answer by return mail whether or not you can be our guest, that we can arrange your reservations. Guest, eh? Well, isn't that nice of them? It certainly is. I don't see how the Businessmen's Association can afford that. Well, I guess business has been good all over. <laughs> That's exactly what I need, a trip to Chicago. Bessie? Yes, sir? Wire and tell them the president of the Jolly Boys accepts. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, you said the Jolly Boys didn't have a president. No, it won't take long to hold it in action. <laughs> <laughs> you send that telegram to Chicago and take the rest of the day off, Bessie. After all, it's Washington's birthday. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think I'll take the day off, too. There's one president to another. I think I owe it to good old George. <laughs> That 
That's right, Chief. I'll see you at the Jolly Boys meeting. Goodbye. Bum, bum, bum for president. Well, that takes care of everything. All five members will be there tonight. Hey, Al, can I go to Chicago with you? Leroy, what would you do in Chicago? Go to the stockyards. <laughs> stockyards? Yeah, we've been studying about them in school. Well, in school is a good place to study them, my boy. Oh, can't I go? I'm sorry, Leroy, but this is strictly for us presidents. Excuse me, Mr. President. Who? Oh, me. Yes, Bertie. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Bertie? You want your blue serge suit clean for the trip? Good idea, Bertie. You better send both pairs of pants. I'll be there three days. Yes. <laughs> better have one of my hats clean, too, Bertie. The gray fuzzy one, Miss Gilsley? No, you better send the black Homburg. It's a little tighter in Chicago's the Windy City. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that sure is a good place for a convention, the Windy City. <laughs> oh, brother. Hello, Uncle Morris. Hello, Marjorie. How are things going? Oh, fine. I'm practically ready to jump on the train. Anki, I hate to bring this up, but what if they don't elect you president? What? Maybe you're counting your trip before it's hatched, Dunk. <laughs> Nonsense. Who else would the Jolly Boys elect? Judge Hooker and I have been close friends for years. He'll vote for me. Well, I guess he would. And I do a lot of business with Peavy. He has to vote for me. And I'm a good spender in Floyd's Barbershop. And Police Chief Gates knows I have a lot of influence with the mayor. He isn't going to take any chances. That's four votes right there. Five. Five? Yeah, you'll vote for yourself. <laughs> well, Truman and Dewey did. Why shouldn't I? <laughs> Certainly glad I ran into you on the way down, Judge. Thank you, Gelda. What's the idea of the special meeting tonight? Well, it's always good to get together with you, Horace. Oh? After all, we've been friends for a long time. Close friends. Yes, we have. Well, let's remember that. What? <laughs> well, here we are, Horace. After you. No, no, you go first, Gelda. Oh, no, after you. Well, if you insist. Hi, you're polite tonight. Well, politeness never lost any friends. Or an election. <laughs> Guess Floyd's remembering up his fingers. Guess so, Judge. Hello, Floyd. Oh, hi, Commissioner. Floyd, I never heard you play better than you're playing tonight. Yeah? Beautiful. I was trying a new piece, Kitten on the Keys. Hmm? <laughs> Sounds more like a cat on a tin roof to me. <laughs> What? No, Judge. Well, there's Peavy opening the Cokes. Excuse me, fellas. Why not? No, 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 not listen. Listen. Hello, Peavy. Yeah, hello, Mr. Gildy Speed. <laughs> Can I offer you a Coke? Thanks, but you have one first, Peavy. Hmm, here's one already open. No, you take it, Peavy. You're not behind the soda fountain tonight. I'm not a customer. I'm a friend. How oh, yeah. <laughs> Of course, I'm going to be a good customer tomorrow. Well, you don't say. Yes, sir. Thought I'd drop in and buy a lot of vitamin pills and things, Peavy. Come to think of it, I guess I'm one of your best customers. Well, yes, come to think of it. Glad you're thinking about it. Well, hello, fellas. Hey, it's the chief. Now he can sing. We're waiting for you, chief. You had to wait. A quartet can't get the first bass without a good bass singer. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Very good, chief. Finest bass voice I've ever heard. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Let's gather around the piano, gang, and have a song. Yes, I've never felt in better voice. Well, that's not exactly why I call the meeting. Darling, I am growing old. He's not kidding. There is a tavern in the town, in the town. No, no. Peavy, Peavy, not on Washington's birthday. Yeah, yeah. Hey, here's one we always murder. Sweet 16. Great idea, Floyd. There's a solo part for me. Okay, here it comes. Here's your note, Commission. Thanks. I love you as I never loved before. Since first I met you. Come to me, or my dream of love 
Policeman. <laughs> By the way, Chief, I've been telling the mayor what a good job you're doing. Singing? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, at the department, PV. There are big things in store for you down there, Chief, if I have my way. Oh? Hey, Commish, why are you stroking everybody's fur? Did you call this meeting to borrow some money? Yeah. <laughs> no, Floyd, but since we're all together, there is a little business we could take up. Business? Yeah? Like what? Well... Has it ever occurred to you fellows that we don't have a president? Why do we need a president? Well, every organization worth its salt has a president, fellas. Of course, I know it's a thankless job, and not many people want to take on the extra work and responsibility, but I think we jolly boys should have a president. I think you're right, Gildy. I've always thought the club meetings were lacking in parliamentary procedure. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> we lack organization, people. How do the rest of you feel about it? It's okay by me. I ain't got nothing against presidents. <laughs> Why don't we have an election next Saturday night at our regular meeting? Why wait that long, Horace? But we're not prepared, Gildy. Who's not prepared? <laughs> I just happen to have some ballots right here in my pocket. My, my. <laughs> <laughs> Made them out this afternoon, fellas. Here's one for each of us. Say, you're on the ball, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Here's a pencil apiece, fellas. <laughs> Just write in the name of the man of your choice. Great idea, Commish. And just because it is my idea, you fellows don't necessarily have to vote for me. <laughs> Gildy, my compliments. Mm. You've done some very constructive thinking for us. Well, I'm always thinking of ways to make the club better. Uh, where do we put the ballots, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, we might as well drop them here in my hat. <laughs> I've got the election in there anyway. <laughs> hey, uh, Commish, and may the best man win. Thank you, Floyd. Judge, why don't you count the ballots? Very well. Here's one for Chief Gates. Uh, the chief? One for Floyd Munson. Well, what do you know? Uh, <laughs> well, here's one for me. I know there's one for me in there someplace. <laughs> and here's one for Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. You bet. One more vote coming up. I wonder who it'll be for. Well, here's the last ballot. A vote for Peavy. <laughs> Peavy, you didn't vote for yourself, too. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, my goodness, what an election. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will return in just a darn minute. Would you like a recipe for a cheese dish that's quick to fix and delicious enough for king or queen? Well, here it is. Pabstet Rabbit. Just melt one package of Pabstet over low heat in a double boiler. Gradually add one quarter of a cup of cream, stirring constantly. Then stir in one quarter of a teaspoonful of dry mustard, one quarter of a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce, and a dash of cayenne. Pour over crisp toast and serve with broiled bacon. What a lunch. What a supper. What a taste pleaser any time you need something good in a hurry for folks who drop in. But remember, for this recipe, be sure to use Pabstet, that wonderful pasteurized processed cheese food with the real cheddar flavor. For the basic flavor you want in any rabbit is cheddar, and the flavor of Pabstet comes from cheddar cheese of genuine distinction. And whether you use it in rabbits or in sandwiches or salads or chilled and sliced into firm, eye-pleasing wedges, you want the pasteurized processed cheese food with the real cheddar flavor. Get Pabstet tomorrow at your grocer's. Well, 
Well, the Upstate Association of Businessmen's Clubs sent a letter inviting the president of the Jolly Boys to attend a three-day convention in Chicago. And last night, when the great Gildersleeve called a meeting of the five Jolly Boys to elect a president, he had no idea it would end in a five-way deadlock. Imagine those conceited guys all voting for themselves. I can't tell a little family I only got one vote. My own. Hi, Mr. President. Stand up, Marge. Oh, yes, of course. Good morning, Mr. President. You can sit down, children. Is it unanimous, Unc? Well, in a way, my boy. <laughs> Rocco and I had dinner with his parents last night, Unky, and Mr. Thompson wants you to look up some of his prominent friends when you're in Chicago. Uh, I must do that. Sometime when I'm in Chicago. Well, I just couldn't help telling him, Unky. I wanted to impress the Thompsons. Oh, yes. I've been using it to good advantage, too. Watch this, Leroy. Yeah. My history teacher's always bragging about where Columbus went, so I told her you were going to Chicago. Yes. <laughs> well, you children may as well know your old uncle may not get to Chicago. What? You weren't elected president, Unky? Well, I got as many votes as anybody. <laughs> But we'll have to do it all over again on Saturday night. Gee, I hope you win, Unky. Thank you, my dear. Morning, Miss Gilsley. Hey, good morning, Bertie. Here's a breakfast fit for a president. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Unk's no president, Bertie. He ain't. Well, I didn't get a big enough majority, Bertie. We've got to vote again Saturday night. Yes, sir. Mr. Gilsley, maybe you didn't campaign hard enough. Are you kidding? Uh... <laughs> all right, Leroy. Mr. Gilsey, when you're campaigning for office, you've got to get on the good side of the voters. Well, I tried that, Bertie. I passed out compliments to all of them. I even told Chief Gates he had a good singing voice. On Washington's birthday? Leroy. <laughs> if that didn't work, Mr. Gilsey, you ought to haul out the pork barrel. Yeah. Pork barrel? Yes, sir. Invite the members over for one of Bertie's ham dinners. Yeah. Bertie, a ham dinner isn't what they mean by pork barrel. Well, if you want votes from them hungry jolly boys, I know how to get them. Well, Bertie, yes. Uh... Just invite them over for one of Bertie's ham dinners. See, it might work. Might work? Mr. Gilsey, you know all you got to do to get the votes out of them jolly boys? I think I do, Bertie. That's right. Invite them over for one of Bertie's ham dinners. <laughs> uh, uh, I wonder which one's the hungriest. <laughs> Well, hello, Floyd. Hi, Commish. Well, it be shave. Not this morning, Floyd. Haircut? No, I. Shampoo? Floyd. The reason I came in. Massage? No, Floyd. <laughs> Pushy barber. And why'd you come in? I came in to extend you an invitation, Floyd. Yeah? I'd like to invite you and your little wife over for a ham dinner. Me and Lovey? Gosh, we never been to your house to put on the feed bag. Well, that's exactly why, why I'm inviting you, Floyd. How about tonight? Oh, sorry, Commish. Can't make it tonight. Why not? Judge Hook has invited us over to his house. <laughs> Pretty cool. But we ain't going. You're not? Nope. I, uh, I'm having Chief Gates over to my house. <laughs> Everybody has his hand in the pork barrel. <laughs> What can I do for you today? Uh, nothing, P.B. No vitamins? Uh, vitamins? Last evening, you said you'd be in and buy a lot of vitamins. I did? Uh, see, that's right, P.B. Let's see what you've got. Uh, yeah, well. Uh, George, I'll show those other guys. I'll cinch a boat right here. Uh, what are you taking the vitamins for, Mr. Gildersleeve? The cinch a boat? <laughs> I mean for an itchy throat. <laughs> Brother, that was close. I have quite a few brands here, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, all those uh, vitamins, Peavy? Yeah, it says so on the label. Now, here's vitamin A, B, B1, C, D. All right, Peavy, I haven't got time for the whole alphabet. I'll take that green bottle there. Very well. That one only has the one vitamin, B1. Uh, now, here's the B complex. I'll tell you what, Peavy, give me a bottle of each. Exactly. A bottle of each it is. Well... Quite a large purchase, eh, P.B.? Yes, runs into several dollars, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good. <laughs> now, P.B., about this election Saturday night, has it occurred to you that if one member threw his vote to a good customer, uh, I mean, a friend, that that person could be elected president? 
Well, I guess he could. You bet. Now, what do you say, Peavy? <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, how'd you like to come over to dinner tonight? <laughs> Peavy, not you, too. <laughs> Gildersleeve? Yes, I know, Bessie. You can have the afternoon off. Oh, I wasn't thinking of that, Mr. Gildersleeve. I mean, it's your election night. Don't remind me of it, Bessie. Uh, a free trip to Chicago with all expenses paid, but I've missed the boat, Bessie. Oh, I'm sorry. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, how could you get from here to Chicago in a boat? Yeah. <laughs> Figure of speech, Bessie. I don't stand a chance of being elected tonight. All the jolly boys are out campaigning for themselves. Well, I wouldn't feel too badly. Maybe the water commissioners will have a convention in Chicago sometime. No, the water commissioners always meet at Niagara Falls. <laughs> but that's where people go for their honeymoon. Yes, yes. I wonder why more couples don't go to Chicago. Let's drop the subject, Bessie. <laughs> Chicago is just a pipe dream. Oh, I guess that's why more honeymooners don't go there. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, never mind. Well, I'm a little late for the meeting, but I don't feel much like going tonight anyway. Gildersleeve, you really stepped out of bounds when you wired Chicago you were president of the Jolly Boys. Well, my vote's lost. Might as well give it to Judge Hooker. Let him go to Chicago. He can bring Leroy a picture of the stockyards. The old goat may meet some of his friends there. And he... <laughs> hey, here comes the commission now. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Foss. Evening, Gilda. You're a little late. Hmm? Have you figured out who you're going to vote for? Frankly, Judge, I've decided to vote for you. Well, I appreciate your support, Gilda, but it won't be necessary for you to vote at all. It won't? Tell him, Peavy. We've already voted, Mr. Gildersleeve. What? You couldn't vote without me? We had a quorum, Commissioner. That means that most of us were here. Yeah. <laughs> I know, Peavy. Guess who was elected the high muckety muck? Not you, Floyd. Nope. You. Me? Congratulations, Gilda. You received all four votes. Well, thank you, fellas. Chicago, here I come. <laughs> Everybody voted for you, Commissioner. It was anonymous. <laughs> Lloyd, it was unanimous. That's what I said. <laughs> well, whatever it was, the good old jolly boys. Real friends, that's what you are, every one of you. The way things turned out, there was only one man for the job. And that was you, Commissioner. Well, good old chief. Believe me, fellas, this is a touching tribute. I'll do my best to serve with honor in this high post to which you've elected me. My, my. <laughs> Thank you, Peavy. Of course, I realize the burden of responsibility which attends a position of this kind. There'll be work to do, and trips which I'll have to take in the line of duty. But by George, I'll carry the load. I have broad shoulders. That's what we figured. <laughs> Good old Floyd. Uh, by the way, Mr. President... What? Oh, are you talking to me, Peavy? I was going to suggest, Mr. President... And now, Peavy, you... you don't have to stand on formalities. I'm just one of the jolly boys. Being president isn't going to change me one bit. I'll never lose that common touch. <laughs> I think what Peavy was about to suggest, Gildy, and? was that you read this letter. Huh? It came addressed to the president of the Jolly Boys Club. Well, that's the way it goes. You step into office and you're flooded with work. <laughs> yeah, but I don't mind. It seems the letter is from Chicago. Well, Chicago, what do you know? Well, let me see that. I stopped by your office after you left today, Gildy. The letter was there and Bessie gave it to me. Oh? And since it was addressed to the president of the Jolly Boys, we took the liberty of opening it. That was before the election. Oh, sure. Perhaps you'd like to read it. Well, thank you, Judge. Uh, excuse me. Um, to Mr. Throckmorton P. Gillisleeve, president of the Jolly Boys Club. <laughs> I can't imagine how they knew I was going to be elected. <laughs> read it, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, all right, Floyd. We're very happy to hear that you will represent your club in Chicago. <laughs> we have made reservations for you at the Croydon Hotel, and for your information, we estimate your convention expenses to be approximately a hundred dollars. 
Oh, so that's why you elected me. But, Gildy, on George Washington's birthday, you sent a wire saying you held the office. I know. So we had to make an honest man out of our president. (laughs) Oh, for... Okay, fellas, let's pipe the new president aboard. Now, wait a minute. A hundred dollars. For he's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. What a sneaky way to hold an election. That's no way he can deny. Oh, shut up. The Great Gildersleeve will be right back. Don't forget, when you want to process cheese food with that real cheddar flavor, get Pabstet at your grocer's. For that rich, satisfying Pabstet flavor comes from fine cheddar cheese of real distinction. You can buy Pabstet, either golden or pimento, in the handy round size packaged. Or save money by getting the economical two-pound loaf. In any package and any way you serve it, Pabstet is delicious. It's the pasteurized processed cheese food with the real cheddar flavor. Get Pabstep tomorrow. Chip in to send the president to a convention. Nineteen seventy-five each. Oh, bye, George. I won't go. <laughs> I don't know how I can get out of it, though. Look out! Leroy, what are you doing? I'm learning to ski. I got piggy skis, and boy, is it fun! Watch me come down this driveway. You be careful, Leroy. You can sprain an ankle that way. Yeah, that's how I got piggy skis. He sprained both of his. Huh? He couldn't go to school. He couldn't. a desperate measure. (laughs) Let's see now. Which hurts more, a sprained ankle or a (laughs) hundred dollars? Leroy, let me try your little skis. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. The show was written by Paul West, John Elliott, and Andy White, with music by Jack Meekin. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley, Mary Lee Robb, Lillian Randolph, Gloria Holiday, oh. Arthur Q. Bryan, Ken Christie, Earl Ross, and Vic Legrand. That's so. This is Jay Stewart saying goodnight for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of the famous line of Kraft quality food products. Be sure to listen in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Which suits your taste? Mustard that's mild, delicately spiced, or sharp, snappy mustard with zing in every bite? Either way, you like Kraft prepared mustard. For there are two kinds, salad mustard, tangy but gentle, and Kraft prepared mustard with snappy horseradish added. Have both on hand for different tastes, different uses. Either works magic in bringing out hidden flavor. For when you add a little mustard, you add a lot of tang. Get Kraft prepared mustard. Stay tuned now for the exciting Break the Bank on NBC. The Kraft Foods Company, makers of Kraft Quality Foods, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve.
The Great Gildersleeve is brought to you tonight by Parquet Margarine, that marvelous margarine made by Kraft. Parquet is the margarine millions prefer because it tastes so good. And it tastes so good because it's always fresh. In fact, Parquet Margarine is so good in every way and for every purpose that Kraft can afford to make this offer. Double your money back if you don't say Parquet is the best margarine you ever tasted. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Ask for it at your grocer's tomorrow. Well, it's been a long, hard day at the water department. The great Gildersleeve didn't even get home for dinner. But now, back at long last, the water commissioner lowers himself into his easy chair and sinks to the bottom like a rock in his reservoir. I'm tired, Unky. Worn out, Marjorie. The first of the month sort of slipped up on Bessie and me. Oh? Yeah, came right after February 28th. Didn't expect it for two more days. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. That's all right. Bronco's coming by for me in a few minutes. No, uh, he is. Uh-huh. Are you too tired to drive over to Broadmoor with us and see Mother and Father Thompson? Marjorie, I've seen Mother and Father Thompson. I remember them well. <laughs> now, Uncle, you really should cultivate the Thompsons. That's barren ground. <clears throat> <laughs> He never answers your questions, and she never gives you a chance to ask one. <laughs> eh? Eh, Marjorie, just because you and Bronco are engaged is no reason I have to be married to the Thompsons. All right, Unky. I'll tell him you send your love. Yeah, do that. Miss Gillespie. Yes, Bertie. A party phoned before you came home and wants you to call back. Oh, yes, probably Judge Hooker. He wanted me to play checkers. But wild horses couldn't get me away from this house tonight. I'm not going to be dragged out by an old goat. <laughs> he wasn't the party, Miss Gilsley. Well, whoever it was, I'm not leaving the house. Unky just passed up an invitation to visit the Thompsons. Yeah, hated to do it. Yes, sir. <laughs> you don't want to call this party back, then? I'm too tired to go to the telephone, Bertie. Who was it? Miss Milford. Miss Milford? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going? Well, I said I wouldn't go to the telephone, and I won't. Where's my hat? That man! <laughs> Why, Throckmorton. Hello, Catherine. I phoned you this evening. Yeah, Bertie said you wanted me to ring you back, so I'm doing it. <laughs> Rockmore. May I come in or do you want to talk long distance? Oh, come on in. I won't keep you a minute. You won't? Mm. Bertie said you didn't get home for dinner. You must be awfully tired. Me? No. Well, I'm glad because I want to talk to you about tomorrow night. Great. What are we going to do tomorrow night? I've invited Marjorie over, remember? Oh, yes, yes. You're going to help Marjorie with some sewing. Well, why don't you and I sew for a couple of hours tonight, hmm? What? Look, the button off my cuff. <laughs> Trot more than that won't take two hours. It could. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Be good practice for tomorrow night. Marjorie and I aren't going to sew tomorrow night, Throckmorton. Oh? I told her that because I want to surprise her. I'm giving her a bridal shower. You are? Mm -hmm. Well, won't Marjorie be happy? You're awfully sweet to do that, Catherine. I could almost kiss you. Ow, oh, Throckmorton. Shucks, missed again. <laughs> I wanted to know if you mind Bertie helping us out tomorrow night. Bertie, of course I don't mind. Anything at all, Catherine. That's wonderful. And Throckmorton. Huh? You know, giving this shower makes me realize how much I need a man around the house. You, uh, you do? I mean, just to help with the preparations tomorrow night, of course. Oh, oh yes. You really won't mind helping out? Be delighted to help. I think I should be here anyway. After all, what's the shower without the water commissioner? <laughs> Floyd? Well, if it ain't the commish. Hop right up in the chair, commish. Thank you. 
Well, it be? Haircut? You can start with a haircut, my man, then give me the works. Yeah? You had a manicurist? I'd even go for a manicure. Stepping out among them tonight, Commish? Well... Gonna do a little villain and cooing with your turtle dove? Floyd. <laughs> I'll bet you're no turtle among the doves. Oh. <laughs> All jokes alongside, Commish. How's the trained nurse? You mean Miss Milford, of course. Uh-huh. She's fine. Thank you for inquiring. That's okay. Don't trim it too short, Floyd. Leave the wave on the top. Don't worry. Hey, hey, you got another gray hair here. I uh-huh. have? Yep. Pretty soon your wave's gonna have white caps. <laughs> Very funny, white caps. Stick to your hair cutting, Floyd. Okay. Uh, Little Floydy Munson ain't one of them Gabby barbers. Good. Where are you going tonight, Commission? <laughs> if you must know, I'm going over to Miss Milford's, Floyd. She's giving a shower for Marjorie. Oh? What's she going to have you doing? Tipping the teapot for the in-laws? <laughs> <laughs> no, Floyd. That's what I like about this party. The Thompsons aren't going to be there. It's just for Marjorie's girlfriends. You don't like rubbing elbows with the in-laws, huh, Commission? Well, Mrs. Thompson has pretty sharp elbows. Looks down her nose at everybody. Hmm. She thinks she's the queen of Sheba. Yeah? They tell me the old man is something out of this world. That's where his mind seems to be. <laughs> he never knows what's going on. Oh, found a faded hair. That's two of them. Yeah. Every time I think of those Thompsons, another one turns gray. <laughs> ready for Marjorie's surprise shower tonight. Yeah, and she'll like these candlesticks. Most people just bring something for the bride. But I got something for the groom, too. A candlestick apiece. His and hers. <laughs> if I could just sneak in the house without Marjorie seeing me. Hi, Unky. Oh, hello, Marjorie. What's in the box? A box? And then what box? The one you just hid behind your back. Oh, Back isn't as broad as it used to be. It's all slipped around to the front. Come on, Auntie. What's in the box? Uh, well, uh, cigars, my dear. Cigars two feet long? Well, I've been buying longer cigars, so I won't smoke them so short. <laughs> oh? Uh, better get in the kitchen in high days. Uh, see you a little while, my dear. Ta-ta. Ta-ta. Yeah, she doesn't suspect a thing. Don't wait for showers. May come my way. Birdie. Don't wait for showers. Birdie. Yes, sir? Marjorie will hear you. Don't mention showers. Mr. Gilsley, that's just a red herring. Red herring? To throw off the track. What? Miss Marjorie knows she's going to get a shower sometime. And if I sing April shower, she'll think it's going to be next month. <laughs> Very logical, Bertie. <laughs> Bertie, where can I hide this box? It's cigars for Marjorie. I mean, some candlesticks for Marjorie. Oh, a shower present. That's nice. Let's just put it here in the pantry. Yeah, I'd like to give her something a little nicer, but I'm saving up for the wedding present. Can't let those Thompsons outdo me, Bertie. No, sir. If y'all keep feuding this way, it's going to be like the Hatfields and the McCoys. <laughs> Bertie, it'll never come to that. As long as they stay on their side of the mountain. <laughs> What's that? Oh, Catherine at the back door. Catherine, come on in. I knew Marjorie was home, so I came to the back door. Glad you did. Hello, Bertie. How's the cake? Just fine, Miss Milford. Just take a look in the oven. Oh, oh that's beautiful, Bertie. My favorite cake. Granite. I mean, marble. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the expression, Bertie. <laughs> hmm, could hardly wait to get to that shower. Throckmorton, you aren't planning to stay for the shower. Why not? Well, I-, I just wanted you to come over early and help with the preparations. Uh, moving chairs and putting up tables. But... You wouldn't want to stay with a house full of girls. I wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you could talk to Mrs. Thompson. Mrs. Thompson? Is she going to be there? Do you know Throckmorton? I nearly forgot her. Wouldn't that have been terrible? Tragic. Well, Catherine, you've convinced me that shower is no place for me. No, of course not. You men can take care of yourself. Yes, men? Yes. 
Yes, I'm counting on you to entertain Mr. Thompson. Oh, nobody can entertain Mr. Thompson. Now, Throckmorton, it'll only be for about four hours. Four hours with a gasping mackerel. <laughs> oh, Floyd's right. I can feel the white caps whipping up already. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will return in just a minute. It's the margarine that tastes so good because it's fresh. Really fresh. Always fresh. It's parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, when you buy a margarine, there's one thing you want to be sure of. It must be fresh. And that's one thing you can be sure of when you buy parquet margarine made by Kraft. For Kraft's nationwide freshness control guarantees that whenever or wherever you buy parquet, you can always be sure of that fresh, delicious parquet flavor. Parquet margarine is blended from fresh, top-grade American farm products. It's rushed fresh by truck to your grocer. Each parquet package is flavor-dated and stocks are regularly inspected. Any parquet not sold before it passes its freshness peak is returned to Kraft. So remember... Parquet margarine is the margarine that tastes so good. And it tastes so good because it's fresh. Really fresh. Always fresh. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Double your money back if you don't say it's the best margarine you ever tasted. Well, let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. He was all set to attend Marjorie's bridal shower when he found out he had to entertain Marjorie's prospective father-in-law. And he doesn't like the prospect. Uh, a whole evening with an absent-minded book lover. What a miserable night this is going to be. Say, misery loves company. Why don't I get some company? <laughs> Hello, Peavy. Yeah, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I was just thinking about something, Peavy. Yeah, Joe? You <laughs> look like the cat that ate the canary. Well, you look like the canary. <laughs> My dad? Yeah. Peavy, you've heard me talk about Marjorie's future father-in-law, haven't you? Well, yes. A wonderful fellow, Mr. Thompson. Eh? My, my. We're spending the evening together, Peavy, and I'd like to have you join us. Why? Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a brainy fellow, Peavy, and I'd like him to meet some of my more intelligent friends. Have you tried to judge? No, I haven't, Peavy. Judge Hooker can't carry on as sparkling his conversation as you can. Besides, he's out of town. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I believe you said this Mr. Thompson collected first edition. That's right, Peavy. Expert on modern art. You bet. He can tell you anything you want to know about it. Hmm. There must be something I have to do tonight. <laughs> Peavy, don't you try to think of an excuse. Oh, well, I know. Yes, yes. But come to think of it, Mr. Gildersleeve, I do have an obligation this evening. Oh? Mrs. Peavy wanted me at home to play off a rubber of flinch. Flinch? We've been playing for 20 years, and the games are tied. Oh, brother. Well, after playing for 20 years, I know you wouldn't want to give up an evening of flinch. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you fellas care to drop by here around 9 o'clock? <laughs> See you at 9, Peavy. <laughs> Eight o'clock. Where are those Thompsons? Mr. Thompson, so absent my... Say, what if he drove in the wrong direction? Nah, Mrs. Thompson is with him. She'll steer him in. Yeah, there they are. Better go out and greet them. Oop, he's walking across the street. Oh, now she's got him right by the coattail. Hello, over here. What a guy. He can't even remember my name. If he calls me Uncle Snort once more... Good evening, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Mrs. Thompson and Mr. Thompson. Oh, good evening, Gildersleeve. 
Martha, you remember Marjorie's Uncle Snort. <laughs> I spoke to him, Edward, and he's Marjorie's Uncle Mort. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Thompson, everybody's over at Miss Milford's, and I'll be happy to drop you. By the shower, I mean. Thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> well, shall we go? Go where? You just stay close to me, Mr. Thompson. Shall we take our car? Well, I suspect we'd better take my Studebaker. Mr. Thompson and I will need it this evening. Oh? Uh, what are you boys going to do this evening? Well, Mr. Thompson, how would you like... Now, there's a very interesting lecture with slides at the Civic Auditorium. Oh? Yes. Casting light on darkest Africa. It, well, <laughs> that does sound interesting. It's out at 10.30. Uh -huh. I took the trouble to look it up in your summer field paper. Of course you boys go where you want to go. We'd better go to the lecture, Gildersleeve. <laughs> yes, so. Uh, care to sit in front, Mrs. Thompson? No, thank you. If I'm not driving, I like to sit in the back seat. I bet she can drive from either seat. <laughs> well, if everybody's set, we'll back out. <laughs> We're backing out, Martha. Flooded, Mr. Gildersleeve? <laughs> no, no, Mrs. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> You're backing onto your lawn, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm watching. <laughs> Careful of the tree on the other side. <laughs> Watch out for the curb. Here, here comes the car. Talking radar. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, are you sure you know where Miss Milford lives? Oh, yes, been there several times. <laughs> Careful of the corner, Mr. Gildersleeve. There's a traffic light. I know. I had it put there. <laughs> Turn green. Keep going. Please, Mrs. Thompson. I know how to drive. <laughs> Zeke. Oh, good heavens. That woman would make any man strip his gears. <laughs> <laughs> Car is stopped now. You can get out, Mr. Thompson. Out? Oh, yes. Well, I got rid of Mrs. Thompson, but I still have him. This evening certainly went sour. Oh, does that go to sleep? Yeah, I said, I uh, hope your wife has a fine time at the shower. <laughs> <laughs> she will. Who's the bridal shower for, Gildersleeve? Why, it's for Marjorie. Oh, I knew it couldn't be for Martha. It, no. <laughs> Not this one. Well, we'll stop in here. Uh, hello, Peavy. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Peavy, I want you to meet Marjorie's future father-in-law, Mr. Thompson. Good evening, Mr. Peavy. I'm happy to meet you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Gildersleeve told me a lot about you. He has? What did he say? Shall I tell him, Mr. Gildersleeve? <laughs> well, uh... It might really embarrass Mr. Thompson, Peavy. I've been bragging on him quite a bit. Haven't I, Peavy? Well, no, I'm... No! <laughs> Mr. Thompson, uh, Peavy's going to spend the evening with us. Uh... Oh, who's Peavy? Yeah. <laughs> this is Peavy. Oh, oh, to be sure, to be sure. <laughs> uh, I'll be ready as soon as I count the carry. That's fine, Peavy. Uh, by the way, where are we going? Well, it's been suggested that we go to a lecture. Lecture? Yeah, at the auditorium, Peavy. Casting light on darkest Africa. If you gentlemen will excuse me, I think I'll go home and play flinch with Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> but, Peavy, we're counting on you. Gildersleeve, you two go if you want to. Uh, don't count on me. What? I don't have to go to a lecture. I married one. <laughs> <laughs> Thompson, you surprise me. <laughs> Hi, fellas. Hello, Floyd. You close enough, Peavy? I thought I'd walk home with you. Well, I'm not going home right now. Floyd, I'd like to have you meet Mr. Thompson. Floyd Munson, Mr. Thompson. How do you do, Mr. Munson? Hi. Thompson, huh? You got the same name as that in-law the commission's been battling with. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great joker, Mr. Thompson. Barber, you know. <laughs> Barber thought his name was Munson. Oh. <laughs> Barber's name is Munson. Yeah. Floyd, this is Marjorie's future father-in-law. Oh, oh. Gee, I'm sorry, Commish. I could cut my tongue out. I could help you. Uh, I'm ready. 
we lock up the store, shall we go? Where are we going? Floyd, we three have an evening planned. Oh, what do we have planned, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, since you don't care for the lecture, we might go to the library. How are you going to have any fun at the library? Floyd, Mr. Thompson is a collector of first editions. Newspapers? No. <laughs> Floyd, he loves books. He travels all over looking for them. Oh. Oh, hey, speaking of traveling, a salesman was in the shop today. He had a great story about two guys. No, Mr. Floyd. <laughs> I, I'd like to hear that. Yes. Uh, say, Gildersleeve, uh, why don't we take him along? What? Uh, Mr. Munson appears to be quite lively. Uh, say, uh, are there any clubs in town, uh, fellows? Clubs? Oh, you mean men's clubs, where you sit in an evening chair, an, an no. easy chair, and look out the window? No, huh? no, no, night clubs. I, I better go home to Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> Peavy, we haven't any nightclubs, Mr. Thompson. Well, where can we find some noise and activity? Noise? Uh, how about the bowling alley? <laughs> well, what do you know? Well, nice going, Mr. Thompson. Set him up in the other alley. <laughs> Your turn, Peavy. Well, I wait till I find a ball that fits my thumb. That last one carried me halfway down the alley. <laughs> oh, Peavy, you're a caution. Uh, having fun, Mr. Thompson? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, cigarette, Gildersleeve? Cigarette? Mr. Thompson, I didn't know you smoked. Neither does Mrs. Thompson. <laughs> he, he's painting the town tonight. <laughs> over 18 out of 20 ducks. What do we do now? I don't know. You've had us through the Penny Arcade three times. Hey, Commission, I thought you said this guy Thompson was a dull tool. He's running us ragged. <laughs> yeah, I'm bush, Floyd. Hey, Mr. Thompson, it's 11 o'clock. Perhaps we should all go home. Home? Nonsense, Gildersleeve. The night is young, and so are we. Well, I'm saying good night. I feel pretty old after 11 o'clock. <laughs> Good night, Peavy. <laughs> Wish I'd gone home with Peavy. What time is it, Kamesh? Yeah, Floyd, it's 1.15, according to that clock over the pinball machine. Hey, Gildersleeve! I hit the triple whammy! Look at it light up! <laughs> he did? Yeah, if he thinks that's a triple whammy, wait till his wife looks him in the eye. <laughs> this guy never runs down, does he, Kamesh? He must take pills. <laughs> Well, we have to get him home, Floyd. Uh, Mr. Thompson, don't you think we should be going home? Home? I still have 20 nickels left. Have another Coke, fellow. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the evening's still a pup. Yeah, maybe a pup, but I know who's going to be in the doghouse. <laughs> Great evening, Gildersleeve. Yeah, great. <laughs> I was surprised at Munson having to go home at two o'clock. Well, you know how it is with a barber, Mr. Thompson, on his feet all day. I'm afraid we should have all gone home earlier. Oh, are we going home? Yes. Mm. What about Martha? Well, I'm afraid the shower has been over a long time. Miss Milford's house was dark when we passed there. I guess your wife's at my house. Oh, she's at somebody's house. <laughs> You don't seem very concerned about rolling in at 2 o'clock. Oh, what's wrong with 2 o'clock? It's a nice round hour, but <laughs> fewer cars on the street, pleasant motoring. But Mr. Thompson, your wife expected us home at 10.30. Frankly, I'm a little worried. Oh, now, Gildersleeve, leave everything to me. I'll explain to Martha. You will? Naturally. Staying out late was my idea, and I'll assume complete responsibility. Well, good for you, Mr. Thompson. By George, you're all right. You know, there was a time when I thought... Yeah, but you're true blue. 
Well, here we are. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, here we are. Oop. There's Mrs. Thompson waiting for us. <laughs> Looks awfully big standing in that doorway. Looks like she's got in her hand. Oh, it's just a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> here she comes. Oh, brother. Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Mrs. Thompson. Where have you been with Edward? Well, we were at the drugstore. Until 2 a.m.? Well, we did go down to the bowling alley. Bowling alley? Of course, we weren't there very long. We came right home after playing the pinball machines. You had my Edward playing pinball machines? Now, wait a minute. I wasn't the one. Take it, Mr. Thompson. Thompson, wake up. Edward? Oh, my goodness, what a sneaky thing to do. The Great Gildersleeve will be back very shortly. Tomorrow can be a red-letter day for you if it's the day you first try parquet margarine. Once you've tried it, we know that you two will always consider parquet margarine a real shopping find. For parquet is the margarine that millions prefer because it tastes so good. And it tastes so good because it's always fresh. Parquet is the margarine so good that Kraft can afford to make this offer. Double your money back if you don't say it's the best margarine you ever tasted. Yes, if you don't agree parquet is the best margarine you've ever tasted... Send the empty carton with a letter stating your opinions, your name and address, and state the price you paid to Kraft, Box 1163, Chicago 90, Illinois. And Kraft will refund double the price you paid. Put Parquet on your shopping list right now. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Good morning, my dear. Uh... You'll excuse me if I rush, Uncle Mort. This is the day I work at the Red Cross. Oh, maybe I'll go down with you. Really? Yeah. After last night with Mr. Thompson, I need a transfusion. (laughs) My bloodstream is pure (laughs) Coca-Cola. Well, I'm kidding about the transfusion. But I want to be serious a moment about the Red Cross, my dear. Here is an organization which is always ready to serve wherever it's needed. And I don't have to tell you what a great job it does. You've read about it every day in your newspapers, wherever disaster strikes, wherever we are in need, the Red Cross is there. It's our Red Cross, our protection. Let's give it our full support in every way we can. Remember the Red Cross. Good night, everybody, and be sure to be with us next week. Wednesday, the great Gildersleeve has something up his sleeve which is going to be a very special interest to every one of you homemakers. Be sure you're listening next week. The great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. The show is written by Paul West, John Elliott, and Andy White with music by Jack Meekin. Included in the cast are Mary Lee Robb, Lillian Randolph, Kathy Lewis, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Dick Legrand. This is Jay Stewart saying good night for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of the famous line of Kraft quality food products. Want to put magic in leftover meals? Then have plenty of Kraft prepared mustard on hand. Mustard makes hidden flavors pop right out of leftover meats, adds new life to salad or egg dishes. You can get two kinds of Kraft prepared mustard, you know. Salad mustard, mild, delicately spiced, or Kraft mustard with snappy horseradish added. Have both on hand, for when you add a little mustard, you add a lot of tang. Get Kraft prepared mustard. Stay tuned for the exciting new Break the Bank on NBC. The Kraft Foods Company, makers of Kraft Quality Foods, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Tonight.
Tonight's program is a program of special importance because it contains big news for you from the makers of Parquet Margarine. We can't tell you now what the big news is, but just keep tuned to this program. You'll hear all about it before the show is over. Now, The Great Gildersleeve, brought to you tonight by Parquet Margarine. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Well, the great Gildersleeve has been pretty busy lately, what with getting ready for Marjorie's wedding and all. But tonight, he set all problems aside, donned his blue serge suit, and went down to walk his pretty nurse, Catherine Milford, home from the hospital. Yeah, man needs a road map to find his way around in these hospitals. Let's see, Catherine said she'd meet me on the third floor at the intersection of therapy and pediatrics. Hello, Doc Oh, there she is. Hello, Catherine. I'll be just a few minutes. I want to help Dr. Olson with some x-ray pictures. Hmm. Uh, there's a waiting room here if you'd like to sit down. No, I'll just wander around. I'll meet you right here. Yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> Helping Dr. Olson again. Him and his darn x-ray camera. I hope he gets foggy negatives. <laughs> uh, wonder why they leave all the doors open here. You can see right in the rooms. That guy doesn't look very sick. <laughs> Lying in there reading the paper. wonder what he's in for. Oop, he sees me. <laughs> Hello, how do you feel? <laughs> Gee, what a dirty look. There's <laughs> something wrong with his liver. Guess I'll go in the waiting room and sit down. <sighs> Let's see what magazines they have here. Hmm. Woman's Home Companion from last October. The Odd Fellas Annual. Butterick patterns. <laughs> what a collection. Oh, excuse me. Do you mind if I sit down here? What? Oh, no. Sit right down, madam. Plenty of room. <laughs> <laughs> My, it certainly feels good to sit down, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Oh, um, do you know anything about watches? Watches? Well, not very much. I'm in the water business. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm supposed to meet a friend here at nine o'clock, and now my watch has stopped. Maybe you can tell me what's wrong with it. Well, I'm not in the watch business. Yeah, you see, it, it stopped at five o'clock. She's a genius. <laughs> it's a good watch. It just won't run. Yeah. Well, if it's a good watch, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> 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 Where's Catherine? Yeah, suppose you look at the watch and I'll go out and see what time it is. What? All right. I'll be right back. Yeah, good. <laughs> when I get into these things. Came to a hospital to pick up a nurse, and I wind up fixing watches. <laughs> Little tiny wristwatches. Oop. Slipped. Oh, brother, that did it. Right on the marble floor. Well, I'm back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Guess what time it is. Uh, about your watch. You see, I was just... Oh, about... did you fix it? Now, wait, I... Uh... Why, you did. It's running again. It is? Oh, you're simply wonderful. How'd you do it? Oh, nothing. Just a slip of the wrist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ready, Throckmorton. Shall we go? Uh, oh, Catherine. Yeah, let's go. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, don't mention it. Come along, Catherine. It was very kind of you to wait for me tonight, Throckmorton. Oh, that's all right. I just couldn't tear myself away. It's so interesting watching Dr. Olson work. Oh, it is, eh? The way he handles those intricate machines and x ray simply fascinating. I can imagine. You can see that he's talented. He has those long, slender fingers. Octopus. <laughs> I admire men who are skilled with their hands. Don't you, Throckmorton? Well, it would be kind of embarrassing to admit, Catherine. See, I'm rather clever that way myself. You? Certainly. Handcraft has always been one of my specialties. Yes, indeed. Guess you've never noticed, but I have pretty long hands, too. 
Artistic, a lot of people say. <laughs> now, this I never knew about you, Throckmorton. Well, you know what they say, Catherine. Still waters run deep, and I'm a deep river. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Paint? Car? No, I, uh, I like to fix watches. Repair watches? Really, Throckmorton? Well, just as a hobby, that is. Remember that lady in the waiting room? Yes. I fixed her little watch as easy as pie. Really? You bet. I'd like to see Dr. Olson do that. Well, Throckmorton, it takes a master craftsman to do that kind of work. Where did you learn it? Well, you know how it is with a talent like that. It just sort of comes to you, Catherine, right out of the blue. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Yep. Well, here's my house. If it weren't so late, Throckmorton, I'd ask you in. Well, better luck next time. Watch out for the porch steps. Mm. Pretty dark. That's all right. If Mother hears us, she'll turn on the porch light. In that case, let's go up quietly. Huh? <laughs> I guess Mother's asleep. Yeah, bless her little heart. Well, uh, I'll say good night, Throckmorton, and uh, thanks for walking me home. Wait, Catherine, don't go in yet. I really should. Please, this is the first time I ever said good night to you without the porch light. <laughs> Rock more. Such a beautiful night, Catherine. Would you give me just one little kiss? Well, I... Please. I, you, you, you ha haven't told me how Marjorie is. How, how is she getting along with plans for the wedding? The wedding plans are going fine, but let's talk about us. Catherine. How's uh, Leroy? <laughs> Leroy's fine. What's he doing? He's making a wedding present for Marjorie in the basement. Really? Catherine. What kind of a present? <laughs> He's making her a footstool. Oh, my, that's nice. Catherine. Is he uh, uh, making a footstool by himself? Oh, my goodness. Catherine, we can talk about Leroy any time. I think it's very commendable that he's making a gift for Marjorie. He must be clever with his hands, like you. Well, I imagine I have taught him a few things. I have a workbench in the basement, and I let him use the tools. Oh, I think that's wonderful. A real craftsman like you can do anything. I know one thing I'm not doing too well. <laughs> Most of all, Throckmorton, I admire a craftsman who's willing to take the time to help a little boy like Leroy. You do? Mm-hmm. Close your eyes, Throckmorton. They're closed. <laughs> <laughs> she kissed me. By George, I am a craftsman. <laughs> Bertie. Oh, Miss Milford, nice to see you. Won't you come in? I was just going by, Bertie. I, I don't suppose Mr. Gildersleeve is home. No, ma'am, he's at the office. Something I can tell him? Well, I have a little favor I'd like to ask of him. <laughs> He'll do it for you, Miss Milford, I'm sure. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve was telling me last night that he's an expert with tools and machinery. Come again? <laughs> well... That he has a workshop in the basement. Uh, I brought over a kitchen knife of Mother's. It's one of her special favorites. I have it right here. Say, that is a good knife. Mm -hmm. Mother's had it for years. Wouldn't let anything happen to it. And, of course, I had to drop it on the sink this morning and make a big nick in the blade. Oh, that's too bad. I bet your mama got pretty upset. She doesn't know about it, Bertie. I sneaked the knife out of the house. <laughs> I wonder if Mr. Gildersleeve could grind down the edge of the blade and take that nick out of it. I don't know, but I'll sure tell him about it. Oh, I know he can fix it. He's so clever about these things. Yes, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't trust anybody else to touch it. No, ma'am. Well, I'll leave the knife with you, Bertie. Tell Mr. Gildersleeve I'll pick it up tomorrow. All right, I'll take it down to the cellar and put it on his workbench. Oh, and you can tell him it belongs to Mother. He'll know it's important. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Young! Hello, Leroy. Are you home for the day? I guess so. Saturday afternoon, thought I'd do a little reading. Gee, Uncle, will you come down to the basement and help me with my F-O-O-T-S-T-U-L-E? 
F F O O T S T U L E. Yeah. My footstool. Oh, brother. How can you make a footstool? You can't even spell it, Leroy. <laughs> That's just to throw Marge off the track in case she's listening. Yes, yes. Come on down to the basement and we'll have a look at it, my boy. <laughs> See, it's going to be keen when I get it finished, Unc. Leroy, is this a footstool? Sure, I figured it out myself. Looks to me like steps. Yeah, that's the idea. It's a footstool for three different pairs of feet. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness, a three-passenger footstool. Sure. I wonder if No, my boy, three is enough. Now, let's see, what's holding you up? I ran out of money. Money? Yeah. I drilled a hole where a hole shouldn't be. Then I had to buy some putty to fill up the hole. Now I haven't got enough to buy a putty knife. Fifty cents will turn the trick. Now, just a minute, Leroy. You can't be running out every five minutes and buying tools. Would you get it for me? That's not the point. A real craftsman doesn't have to race down to the hardware store every time he needs some simple little tool. He looks around on his workbench till he finds a piece of metal that he makes his own tools. Are you kidding? Certainly not. Got to use your head, my boy. Be ingenious. That's what makes a clever craftsman. Now, let's look at your little problem. You need a putty knife. I figured that out already. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what we have here on the workbench. A yeah. set of Christmas tree lights. Bird cage. Flip gun. Ukulele. You're going to make a putty knife out of that? <laughs> Just keep your shirt on, Leroy. Hmm. Have to clean this bench up sometime. What you going to use, Unc? Well, here's something. This old kitchen knife. Just what we need. Where'd that come from? Well, how should I know? Simply have to use your eyes and your brain, my boy. Now, you see, the knife has a nick in it. So, uh, you know what we're going to do? I'll bite. Very simple. You turn the grindstone, and I'll grind the end off. I'll show you the slickest putty knife you ever saw. Golly, you're a genius, huh? You bet. Crank up the grindstone. Yeah. Now, watch this. I'll round out the end. Look at the sparks. Yeah. We're shaping the tool. A little ingenuity, a little brain work, that's all it takes. Wait till I tell Catherine about this. You really know your stuff, Bunk. This is a swell putty knife. Well, you keep your eyes open, my boy. You can learn a few things from your old uncle. Gee, I wish I had a little saw. Saw? Yeah, they're heading down at the hardware store. Now, hold on, Leroy. (laughs) Give me that old knife again. I'll show you another trick. We'll put some teeth on it and make a saw. Hand me the file, Leroy. What a character. (laughs) By George. Now, how do you like that? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a real craftsman tool, my boy. And all out of an old kitchen knife. Round on the end for puttying, teeth on one edge for sawing, and I sharpened the other edge for whittling. So is what you can do with a little brain work, my boy. Excuse me, you down there? Yeah, I'm in the basement, Bertie. Sounds mighty busy down there. Yeah, I'm showing Leroy a few shortcuts. Well, speaking of shortcuts, Mr. Gilsey, did you find a kitchen knife on your workbench? Yeah, what about it? It's supposed to be sharpened up and the nick taken out of it. Sharpened up? Well, I'll be seeing you, Unc. <laughs> Leroy, where are you going? My heart knows where the world was going. And I'm going to go where the world was going. That boy. Now, what about this old kitchen knife, Bertie? Old oh, kitchen knife? Mr. Gilsey, that knife belongs to Mrs. Milford. It's her pride and joy. Mrs. Milford? Zeke? Miss <laughs> Captain brought it over this morning. It's her mama's special favorite kitchen knife. She said you was a craftsman and you could take the nick out of the blade. Can you do it? Can I do it? <laughs> I doed it. The Great Gildersleeve will be right back. Remember, we're going to have big news for you in just a few minutes. Have pencil and paper ready so you won't miss a thing. It's news, big news from Parquet Margarine, 
The margarine that's so good, its makers can afford to say, double your money back if you don't agree that parquet margarine is the best margarine you ever tasted. Keep tuned to this program. Big news for you in just a few minutes. Well, the great Gildersleeve is quite a craftsman. He managed to take a big kitchen knife with the nick in the edge and with a little fancy work on the grindstone, convert it into a... Well, it has teeth on one side, the cutting edge on the other, and it's round on the end. Pretty clever. The only catch is the knife belonged to Catherine's mother. Uh, Why didn't somebody tell me this was Mrs. Milford's? The way she cherishes everything in her kitchen. Can't tell Catherine what I've done. She couldn't believe I'd be so stupid. I don't know, though. She might. One look at this knife would convince her. Well, I have to try to buy her another one. That's all. Go to the hardware store, Unc. Never mind, Leroy. I'm just a little kid, and I didn't know any better. And am I glad. (laughs) Now, stop making a mountain out of a molehill. I'll buy Mrs. Milford another knife, and that's all there'll be to it. I hope so, Unc, for your sake. Yes, yes. Good luck, Unc. Oh, goodbye, Leroy. (laughs) Hardware store. Afternoon, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hello, Fred. I'm looking for a kitchen knife. Uh, something like this. Mm, I never saw a knife like that, Mr. Gildersleeve. Just between you and me, I doubt if anybody else has either. Well, I I made this one. <laughs> no kidding? Say, that's kind of interesting. What do you call it? Well, uh, I called it quite a few things. <laughs> You're quite a craftsman, Mr. Gildersleeve. Small saw edge on one side, cutting blade on the other, round edge... Rosewood handle? Yeah, but what I'm looking for is the kind of a knife I made it out of. I didn't get that. The knife I made this out of. You see, I ground another knife down and reshaped it. But now I, well... Oh, one of those little mistakes, eh, Mr. Gildersleeve? (laughs) Now, wait a minute. Oh, I know how it is. I'm a a married man. Well, I'm not. (laughs) That's right, you're not. Just try and visualize what the knife looked like before... You must have one around. Hmm... Yes? You have one? No. Oh, Fred. But we did have one. Uh, Last year it was. Oh, that's going to be a big help. As I recall, I sold it to Judge Hooker. You know the judge? Judge Hooker? Sure, he'll give it to me. Hooker's my best friend. He better be. Well, the judge is home. He has his laundry on the line. Long underwear. Yeah, better take it easy with the judge. Not be too anxious to get that knife. If he finds out I want it, he's liable to get up on his high horse. <laughs> that bell. Uh, why did I ever tell Catherine I was a craftsman? Machinist. Can't even cut my own fingernails. Well, Gelday. Hello, Judge. This is an unexpected pleasure, Gelday. What brings you to my house this time of day? High tide in the water department? (laughs) Very funny, Judge. (laughs) No, this is just a social visit. (laughs) Mind if I come in? Oh, by all means do. I uh, simply decided it's been a long time since we saw each other, Judge. Oh? Can't let a fine old friendship like ours wither on the vine. (laughs) Oh, no. Now that we've watered the vine, what's the favor that you want to ask? (laughs) Judge. I know you, Gilday. What is it? What a suspicious mind. All I'd drop by for, Judge, aside from a friendly visit, was to see if you had a plain kitchen knife that you bought down at Fred's hardware store last year. Kitchen knife? It's not the least bit important, Judge. Just thought I'd check with you, that's all. Yes, I do have a knife I bought from Fred. What about it? Well, it doesn't matter at all, but I thought if you wanted to get rid of it... (laughs) Gilday! Oh, for Horace, if you must know the truth, I'm in a very embarrassing position. I've got to have that knife. What for? Well, I made a little mistake. Catherine Milford brought one of her mother's best knives over to be sharpened, and I didn't know it was hers. I, uh, <clears throat> worked on it a little. Is that it in your hand? Well, that's what's left of it. Can't let her know I did such a stupid thing, Judge. Say, that's quite a work of art. Huh? Teeth, 
cutting edge, round on the end. No cracks, Judge. So you want my knife to take back to Mrs. Milford, is that it? That's roughly the idea. I'll pay you for it, Judge. After all, you've used it for years. I hate to part with it, Gildy. But as a favor to an old friend, I will. Good old Horace. I'll let you have it for just what I paid for it, two dollars. Profiteer. (laughs) It's a deal, though, Judge. Here's your two dollars. But, Gildy, if you take my knife, what will I use to cut my pumpernickel? Well, that's easy. I'll leave you this one that I operated on. Look here. You can slice, spread. You can do anything with it. My, with a knife like this, I can be a real (laughs) cut-up. Pretty sharp, an old goat. (laughs) Now, if I can make Catherine believe this is her mother's knife, I'm in. Ugh. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. (laughs) Gildersleeve, you're going to be mighty lucky if you squeak out of this one. Hello, Throckmorton. Uh, Hello, Catherine. Just stop by to drop off your mother's little knife. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. (laughs) How does it look? Why, it's perfect. (laughs) In fact, I can scarcely believe it's the same knife. (laughs) Uh, well, <laughs> a little fine machine work makes a big change. It's absolutely marvelous what you can do with tools. Isn't that the truth? Thank you, Throckmorton. Your ingenuity saved my life. Oh, saved mine, too. <laughs> Hello, oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> what can I do for you this afternoon? Nothing, PV. Just let me sit down here and take a deep breath. Certainly. No charge for that. <laughs> I was just making up some fresh deviled egg sandwiches, Mr. Gildersleeve. Could I interest you in one? Not now, PV. I just had a very close call. You don't say. Yeah, you'll never believe this, PV. But I've just been through an episode of knife juggling that would have turned your hair gray. Mine's gray already. <laughs> It's a wonder mine isn't. Fortunately, I'm a quick thinker. Beg pardon? I said I'm a quick thinker. Oh, I wasn't sure for a minute. (laughs) Yeah, I ruined a knife that belonged to Catherine Milford's mother, and I had to move fast, Peavy. I put one over on the judge and got a knife away from him that was just like it. She never knew the difference. Pretty trick operation. Mm, Sounds like it. (laughs) Well, you see the judge. He'll tell you all about it. Too bad I had to swindle the old codger. Now, that's funny. What is? The judge was in here a while ago, and he said the same thing about you. What? In fact, I bought a knife from him. You did? What's he doing? Going into the cutlery business? Afternoon, Mr. Peavy. Well, hello, Bertie. Bertie! Hello, Mr. Gillsleeve. I came down to get some ice cream for supper. Well, good. I love ice cream. I'll be with you in a minute, Bertie, as soon as I finish making this sandwich. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. By the way, Mr. Peavy, what kind of knife are you using there? Well, I don't know what you call it. Judge Hooker brought it in, and I bought it from him for two dollars. Peavy, that's the one I gave Hooker. I made it out. Well, I made it out of that knife of Mrs. Milford's. He had no right to sell that. Imagine Hooker doing a thing like that to a fellow jolly boy. If you ask me, Mister Gillsleeve, that's a mighty fine knife you invented. Me? You invented it down in the cellar. I heard you. Yes, but that... look at that knife. The way Mister Peavy makes them sandwiches with it. That's the slickest thing I ever saw. What? Say, that's not bad. Is this really an invention of yours, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, I made it, Peavy. Yes, sir. That's what Mr. Gildersleeve was doing in the basement. He was inventing the knife. That's right, Bertie. He got a soft tooth edge on one side for cutting bread, and got a sharp edge on the other side for slicing, got a round end on it for spreading. Well, that's a knife every woman's going to want in her kitchen. Why, George, Bertie, I knew that all the time. My, my. (laughs) Well, since it's my knife, Peavy, I really should have it back. Shouldn't I? Well, I'll sell it to you for two dollars. <laughs> two dollars again? All right, this time it's worth it. What you gonna call your new knife, Mr. Gillsleeve? Well, how about Gildy's Blade? Gildy's Blade? That's just right! <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Peavy, ain't Mr. Gillsleeve the smartest man you ever seen? Well, now. I'm... Don't say it, Peavy. <laughs>
Yes, sir, Peavy and Bertie certainly know a good kitchen utensil when they see it. And that, friends, brings me to the news. And it's real news, because you can get an exact duplicate of that knife Gildy invented. And it's a sensational bargain. Listen, Gildy's Blade is really a double-edged knife spatula, the first of its kind ever manufactured. That's right, a three-in-one kitchen implement that combines the uses of two fine kitchen knives and the spatula all in one. Now, let me describe it. Basically, the knife spatula is a flat blade of mirror-finished stainless spring steel, one and one-quarter inches wide and seven inches long. It's set in a polished, imported rosewood handle four and three-quarters inches long. Overall length is just under a foot, about the length of your favorite bread knife. One side of the blade has a lifetime serrated edge that never needs sharpening. That makes it a superb knife for slicing bread, cake, fruits, vegetables, anything you want to slice without crushing. And the other side has a hand-honed, razor-keen, straight-edged blade. That's a big, all-purpose kitchen knife for any kind of cutting, paring, or peeling. Two edges for the same blade. Two fine kitchen knives in one. And then, in addition... The wide, flat, springy blade is spatula-shaped. Turns flapjacks, fried eggs, fried potatoes, scrapes, and mixes. So there you are, three implements in one. Two fine kitchen knives and a spatula in one handle. Why, that knife spatula would cost at least $2 if you could buy it at a store. But listen, you can get one from us for just 50 cents. Plus the label or wrapper from any loaf of bread you buy at your dealer's and the red end flap of a package of parquet margarine. What a bargain! Remember, this knife spatula was invented by Gildersleeve. Actually has his name on the blade. So there's only one way to get it. Mail your half dollar, your bread label or wrapper, and the red end flap from a parquet package to Kraft Foods Company, Box 5939, Chicago 77, Illinois. Now write down that address. Kraft Foods Company... Box 5939, Chicago 77, Illinois. Send 50 cents, a bread label or wrapper, and the red end flap of a package of parquet margarine. Be sure to include your own name and address, and your wonderful knife spatula, Gildy's Blade, will be mailed to you immediately. And now, here again is the great Gildersleeve. Well, folks, we had a lot of fun making this knife, but it's really a good thing. And Bertie wasn't kidding. Use it and enjoy it. Good night, everybody, and see you next week. <laughs> the Great Gilder Sleeve is played by Harold Perry. The show was written by Paul West, John Elliott, and Andy White, with music by Jack Beacon. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley, Lillian Randolph, Kathy Lewis, Earl Ross, and Dick Legrand. This is Jay Stewart saying good night for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of the famous line of Kraft quality food products. Be sure to listen in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Here's a taste test that counts. Try any meat without mustard. Then add a golden dab of Kraft prepared mustard to your next bite. Taste the difference. There are two kinds of Kraft mustard, you know. Salad mustard, delicately spiced for those who like their mustard mild, or Kraft prepared mustard with snappy horseradish added. Have both on hand. For remember this, when you add a little mustard, you add a lot of tang. Get Kraft prepared mustard. Have you heard the new Break the Bank? It's next on NBC. And Mr. Thompson wants you to look up some of his prominent friends when you're in Chicago. Uh, I must do that sometime when I'm in Chicago. <laughs> well, I just couldn't help telling a monkey. I wanted to impress the Thompsons. Oh, yes. I've been using it to good advantage, too. Watch this, Leroy. Yeah. My history teacher's always bragging about where Columbus went, so I told her you were going to Chicago. Yes. <laughs> well, you children may as well know your old uncle may not get to Chicago. What? You weren't elected president, Uncle? Well, I got as many votes as anybody. <laughs> but we'll have to do it all over again on Saturday night. Gee, I hope you win, Uncle. Thank you, my dear. 
Morning, Miss Gilsley. Hey, good morning, Bertie. Here's a breakfast fit for a president. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Hulk's no president, Bertie. He ain't. Well, I didn't get a big enough majority, Bertie. We've got to vote again Saturday night. Yes, sir. Mr. Gilsley, maybe you didn't campaign hard enough. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Leroy. Mr. Gilsey, when you're campaigning for office, you've got to get on the good side of the voters. Well, I tried that, Bertie. I passed out compliments to all of them. I even told Chief Gates he had a good singing voice. On Washington's birthday? Leroy. <laughs> if that didn't work, Mr. Gilsey, you ought to haul out the pork barrel. Yeah. Pork barrel? Yes, sir. Invite the members over for one of Bertie's ham dinners. Yeah. Bertie, a ham dinner isn't what they mean by pork barrel. Well, if you want votes from them hungry jolly boys, I know how to get them. Well, Bertie, yes. Uh... Just invite them over for one of Bertie's ham dinners. See, it might work. Might work? Mr. Gilsey, you know all you got to do to get the votes out of them jolly boys? I think I do, Bertie. That's right. Invite them over for one of Bertie's ham dinners. <laughs> Uh, I wonder which one's the hungriest. Well, hello, Floyd. Hi, Commish. Well, a be shave. Not this morning, Floyd. Haircut? No, I... Shampoo? Floyd, the reason I came in... Massage? No, Floyd. Pushy barber. And why'd you come in? I came in to extend you an invitation, Floyd. Yeah? I'd like to invite you and your little wife over for a ham dinner. Me and Lovey? Gosh, we never been to your house to put on the feed bag. Well, that's exactly why, why I'm inviting you, Floyd. How about tonight? Oh, sorry, Commish. Can't make it tonight. Why not? Judge Hook has invited us over to his house. <laughs> Pretty cool. But we ain't going. You're not? Nope. I, uh, I'm having Chief Gates over to my house. <laughs> Everybody has his hand in the pork barrel. <laughs> Hello, PB. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. What can I do for you today? Uh, nothing, PB. No vitamins? Uh, vitamins? Last evening, you said you'd be in and buy a lot of vitamins. I did? Uh, see, that's right, Peavy. Let's see what you've got. Yeah, well. Hi, right, George, I'll show those other guys. I'll cinch a vote right here. Uh, what are you taking the vitamins for, Mr. Gildersleeve? To cinch a vote? I, I, I mean for an itchy throat. <laughs> Brother, that was close. I have quite a few brands here, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, all those uh, vitamins, Peavy? Yeah, it says so on the label. Now, here's vitamin A... B, B1, C, D... All right, Peavy, I haven't got time for the whole alphabet. I'll take that green bottle there. Very well. That one only has the one vitamin, B1. Uh, now, here's the B complex. Uh, I'll tell you what, Peavy, give me a bottle of each. Exactly. A bottle of each it is. Well, quite a large purchase, eh, Peavy? Yes, runs into several dollars, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good. <laughs> now, Peavy, about this election Saturday night, has it occurred to you that if one member threw his vote to a good customer... Uh, I mean, a friend, that that person could be elected president? Well, I guess he could. You bet. Now, what do you say, Peavy? Mr. Gildersleeve, how'd you like to come over to dinner tonight? <laughs> Peavy, not you, too. Gildersleeve? Yes, I know, Bessie. You can have the afternoon off. Oh, I wasn't thinking of that, Mr. Gildersleeve. I mean, it's your election night. Don't remind me of it, Bessie. Uh, a free trip to Chicago with all expenses paid, but I've missed the boat, Bessie. Oh, I'm sorry. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, how could you get from here to Chicago in a boat? Yeah. <laughs> Figure of speech, Bessie. I don't stand a chance of being elected tonight. All the jolly boys are out campaigning for themselves. Well, I wouldn't feel too badly. Maybe the water commissioners will have a convention in Chicago sometime. No, the water commissioners always meet at Niagara Falls. <laughs> but that's where people go for their honeymoon. Yes, yes. I wonder why more couples don't go to Chicago. Let's drop the subject, Bessie. <laughs> Chicago is just a pipe dream. Oh, I guess that's why more honeymooners don't go there. 
What did you say? Oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm a little late for the meeting, but I don't feel much like going tonight anyway. Gildersleeve, you really stepped out of bounds when you wired Chicago you were president of the Jolly Boys. Well, my vote's lost. Might as well give it to Judge Hooker. Let him go to Chicago. He can bring Leroy a picture of the stockyards. The old goat may meet some of his friends there and he... <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Foss. Evening, Gilda. You're a little late. Hmm? Have you figured out who you're going to vote for? Frankly, Judge, I've decided to vote for you. Well, I appreciate your support, Gilda, but it won't be necessary for you to vote at all. It won't? Tell him, Peavy. We've already voted, Mr. Gildersleeve. What? You couldn't vote without me? We had a quorum, Commissioner. That means that most of us were here. Yeah. <laughs> I know, Peavy. Guess who was elected the high muckety-muck? Not you, Floyd. Nope. You. Me? Congratulations, Gilda. You received all four votes. Well, thank you, fellas. Chicago, here I come. <laughs> Everybody voted for you, Commission. It was anonymous. <laughs> Lloyd, it was unanimous. That's what I said. <laughs> Well, whatever it was, the good old jolly boys. Real friends, that's what you are, every one of you. The way things turned out, there was only one man for the job. And that was you, Commissioner. Well, good old chief. Believe me, fellas, this is a touching tribute. I'll do my best to serve with honor in this high post to which you've elected me. My, my. <laughs> Thank you, Peavy. Of course, I realize the burden of responsibility which attends a position of this kind. There'll be work to do. Um... Trips, which I'll have to take in the line of duty. But by George, I'll carry the load. I have broad shoulders. That's what we figured. <laughs> Good old Floyd. Uh, by the way, Mr. President. What? Oh, are you talking to me, Peavy? I was going to suggest, Mr. President. And now, Peavy, you... you don't have to stand on formalities. I'm just one of the jolly boys. Being president isn't going to change me one bit. I'll never lose that common touch. <laughs> I think what Peavy was about to suggest, Gildy, and? was that you read this letter. Uh? It came addressed to the president of the Jolly Boys Club. Well, that's the way it goes. You step into office and you're flooded with work. <laughs> yeah, but I don't mind. It seems the letter is from Chicago. Well, Chicago, what do you know? Well, let me see that. I stopped by your office after you left today, Gildy. The letter was there and Bessie gave it to me. Oh? And since it was addressed to the president of the Jolly Boys, we took the liberty of opening it. That was before the election. Oh, sure. Perhaps you'd like to read it. Well, thank you, Judge. Uh, excuse me. Um, to Mr. Throckmorton P. Gillisleeve, president of the Jolly Boys Club. <laughs> I can't imagine how they knew I was going to be elected. <laughs> read it, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, all right, Floyd. We're very happy to hear that you will represent your club in Chicago. <laughs> we have made reservations for you at the Croydon Hotel, and for your information, we estimate your convention expenses to be approximately a hundred dollars. Oh, so that's why you elected me. But, Gildy, on George Washington's birthday, you sent a wire saying you held the office. I know. So we had to make an honest man out of our president. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for. Okay, fellas, let's pipe the new president aboard. Now, wait a minute. A hundred dollars. For he's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. What a sneaky way to hold an election. That's no way handy, Mark. Oh, shut up. The Great Gildersleeve will be right back. Don't forget, when you want to process cheese food with that real cheddar flavor, get Pabstet at your grocer's. For that rich, satisfying Pabstet flavor comes from fine cheddar cheese of real distinction. You can buy Pabstet, either golden or pimento, in the handy round size packaged. Or save money by getting the economical two-pound loaf. In any package and any way you serve it, Pabstet is delicious. 
It's the pasteurized processed cheese food with the real cheddar flavor. Get Pab Step. Leroy, what would you do in Chicago? Go to the stockyards. <laughs> stockyards? Yeah, we've been studying about them in school. Well, in school is a good place to study in, my boy. Oh, can't I go? I'm sorry, Leroy, but this is strictly for us presidents. Excuse me, Mr. President. Who? Oh, me. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Bertie? You want your blue serge suit clean for the trip? Good idea, Bertie. You better send both pairs of pants. I'll be there three days. Yes. <laughs> better have one of my hats clean, too, Bertie. The gray fuzzy one, Miss Gilfley? No, you better send the black Homburg. It's a little tighter in Chicago's the Windy City. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that sure is a good place for a convention, the Windy City. <laughs> Hello, brother. Hello, Uncle Moore. Hello, Marjorie. How are things going? Oh, fine. I'm practically ready to jump on the train. Anki, I hate to bring this up, but what if they don't elect you president? What? Maybe you're counting your trip before it's hatched, Dunk. <laughs> Nonsense. Who else would the Jolly Boys elect? Judge Hooker and I have been close friends for years. He'll vote for me. I guess he would. And I do a lot of business with Peavy. He has to vote for me. And I'm a good spender in Floyd's Barbershop. And Police Chief Gates knows I have a lot of influence with the mayor. He isn't going to take any chances. That's four votes right there. Five. Five? Yeah, you'll vote for yourself. (laughs) Well, Truman and Dewey did. Why shouldn't I? (laughs) Certainly glad I ran into you on the way down, Judge. Thank you, Gilda. What's the idea of the special meeting tonight? Well, it's always good to get together with you, Horace. Oh? After all, we've been friends for a long time. Close friends. Yes, we have. Well, let's remember that. What? (laughs) Well, here we are, Horace. After you. No, no, you go first, Gilda. Oh, no, after you. Well, if you insist. Hi, you're polite tonight. Well, politeness never lost any friends. Or an election. (laughs) Guess Floyd's limbering up his fingers. Guess so, Judge. Hello, Floyd. Hi, Commit. Floyd, I never heard you play better than you're playing tonight. Yeah? Beautiful. I was trying a new piece, Kitten on the Keys. Hmm? (laughs) Sounds more like a cat on a tin roof to me. What? No, Judge. Well, there's Peavy opening the Cokes. Excuse me, fellas. Why not? Now, now listen. Hello, Peavy. Yeah, hello, Mr. Yellowstein. <laughs> Can I offer you a Coke? Thanks. But you have one first, Peavy. Hmm, here's one already open. No, you take it, Peavy. You're not behind the soda fountain tonight. I'm not a customer. I'm a friend. How oh, yeah. <laughs> Of course, I'm going to be a good customer tomorrow. Well, you don't say. Yes, sir. Thought I'd drop in and buy a lot of vitamin pills and things, Peavy. Come to think of it, I guess I'm one of your best customers. Well, yes, come to think of it. Glad you're thinking about it. Well, hello, fellas. Hey, it's the chief. Now he can sing. We're waiting for you, chief. You had to wait. A quartet can't get the first bass without a good bass singer. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Very good, chief. Finest bass voice I've ever heard. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Let's gather around the piano gang and have a song. Yes, I've never felt in better voice. Well, that's not exactly why I call the meeting. Darling, I am growing old. He's not kidding. There's a tavern in the town, in the town. No, no. Peavy, Peavy, not on Washington's birthday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, here's one we always murder. Sweet 16. Great idea, Floyd. There's a solo part for me. Okay, here it comes. Here's your note, Commish. Thanks. I love you as I never loved before. Since first I met you. Come to me for my dream of love is I love you as I love you when we were sweet. When
very good, Chief. Well, not bad for a policeman. <laughs> By the way, Chief, I've been telling the mayor what a good job you're doing. Singing? Yeah. No, no, at the department, PV. There are big things in store for you down there, Chief, if I have my way. Oh? Hey, Commish, why are you stroking everybody's fur? Did you call this meeting to borrow some money? Yeah. No, Floyd, but since we're all together, there is a little business we could take up. Business? Yeah? Like what? Well, has it ever occurred to you fellows that we don't have a president? Why do we need a president? Well, every organization worth its salt has a president, fellas. Of course, I know it's a thankless job, and not many people want to take on the extra work and responsibility, but I think we jolly boys should have a president. I think you're right, Gildy. I've always thought the club meetings were lacking in parliamentary procedure. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> We lack organization, Pete. How do the rest of you feel about it? It's okay by me. I ain't got nothing against presidents. <laughs> Why don't we have an election next Saturday night at our regular meeting? Why wait that long, Horace? But we're not prepared, Gildy. Who's not prepared? I just happen to have some ballots right here in my pocket. My, my. <laughs> <laughs> Made them out this afternoon, fellas. Here's one for each of us. Say, you're on the ball, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Here's a pencil apiece, fellas. <laughs> Just write in the name of the man of your choice. Great idea, Commish. And just because it is my idea, you fellows don't necessarily have to vote for me. <laughs> Gildy, my compliments. Mm -hmm. You've done some very constructive thinking for us. Well, I'm always thinking of ways to make the club better. Uh, where do we put the ballots, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, we might as well drop them here in my hat. <laughs> I've got the election in there anyway. <laughs> hey, uh, Commish, and may the best man win. Thank you, Floyd. Judge, why don't you count the ballots? Very well. Here's one for Chief Gates. Uh, the chief? One for Floyd Munson. Well, what do you know? Uh, <laughs> well, here's one for me. I know there's one for me in there someplace. <laughs> and here's one for Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. You bet. One more vote coming up. I wonder who it'll be for. Well, here's the last ballot. A vote for Peavy. <laughs> Peavy, you didn't vote for yourself, too. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, my goodness, what an election. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will return in just a darn minute. Would you like a recipe for a cheese dish that's quick to fix and delicious enough for king or queen? Well, here it is. Pabstet Rabbit. Just melt one package of Pabstet over low heat in a double boiler. Gradually add one quarter of a cup of cream, stirring constantly. Then stir in one quarter of a teaspoonful of dry mustard, one quarter of a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce, and a dash of cayenne. Pour over crisp toast and serve with broiled bacon. What a lunch. What a supper. What a taste pleaser any time you need something good in a hurry for folks who drop in. But remember, for this recipe, be sure to use Pabstet, that wonderful pasteurized processed cheese food with the real cheddar flavor. For the basic flavor you want in any rabbit is cheddar. And the flavor of Pabstet comes from cheddar cheese of genuine distinction. And whether you use it in rabbits or in sandwiches or salads or chilled and sliced into firm, eye-pleasing wedges, you want the pasteurized processed cheese food with the real cheddar flavor. Get Pabstep tomorrow at your grocer's. Well, the Upstate Association of Businessmen's Clubs sent a letter inviting the president of the Jolly Boys to attend a three-day convention in Chicago. And last night, when the great Gildersleeve called a meeting of the five Jolly Boys to elect a president, he had no idea it would end in a five-way deadlock. Imagine those conceited guys all voting for themselves. I can't tell a little family I only got one vote, my own. Hi, Mr. President. Stand up, Marge. Oh, yes, of course. Good morning, Mr. President. You can sit down, children. 
Is it unanimous, Unc? Well, in a way, my boy. <laughs> Rocco and I had dinner with his parents last night, Uncle. The Kraft Foods Company, makers of Kraft Quality Foods, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. When you're hungry for a taste that's rich and satisfying, or your recipes call for a cheese flavor that's really distinctive, here's the name to remember. Pabstet. Yes, Pabstet, the pasteurized processed cheese food that has that real cheddar flavor. That's right, the flavor you get in Pabstet is real cheddar, for it comes exclusively from fine cheddar cheeses of real distinction. You'll taste the difference the minute you taste Pabstet. You can get golden or pimento Pabstead in the handy-sized round package. But after you try it once, you'll want to buy it in a money-saving two-pound loaf. In any package, Pabstead is delicious. Ask for it tomorrow. Well, let's see what's doing with the great Gildersleeve. Today, his hometown of Summerfield is getting a preview of spring. And the water commissioner and his secretary are looking out the office window, getting a view of the preview. What a day, Bessie. Yes, sir. Sun shining like mid-July, and here it is only February 22nd. Yes, sir. Washington's birthday. Yeah. Too bad he didn't have a day like this when he crossed the Delaware. <laughs> it's as clear as a bell. Look, Bessie, you can see the bank. Yes, sir. I guess the employees are off today. It's Washington's birthday. I know, Bessie. <laughs> and look way off there to the right, Bessie. It's not often you can see the tack factory. I guess the tack factory is closed, too. It's Washington's birthday. I get the point, Bessie. Let's go through the mail, and you can take the day off. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. I was hoping you'd give me the day off. Of course, I didn't want to bring it up. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, let's see what we have in the morning mail. This looks like a letter from one of our... Satisfied consumers? Dear Commissioner Gildersleeve, we've intended writing you for some time. Well, because every time our faucet drips, we think of you. <laughs> Hecklers, remind me to answer this sometime, Bessie. I will, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'll make a note of it. What's this? Letter from Chicago. Office of the President of the Upstate Association of Businessmen's Clubs. Oh, that was addressed to the Jolly Boys Club, Mr. Gildersleeve, so the postmaster sent it to you. Oh, see. President of the Jolly Boys Club, Summerfield. Dear Mr. President... Are you president of the Jolly Boys Club, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, we've never elected a president. Let's see what it says. You are doubtless aware that our national convention has been set for March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Chicago. No, I didn't know that. This session promises to even top our last conclave held in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, see? Sounds pretty interesting. I've never been to Chicago. Neither have I. It's only recently that... I've never been to New Orleans either. Bessie. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's only recently that we compiled a complete list of clubs in your city, hence this belated invitation. Hmm. Writes a nice letter. Please answer by return mail whether or not you can be our guest, that we can arrange your reservations. Guest, eh? Well, isn't that nice of them? It certainly is. I don't see how the Businessmen's Association can afford that. Well, I guess business has been good all over. <laughs> That's exactly what I need, a trip to Chicago. Bessie? Yes, sir? Wire and tell them the president of the Jolly Boys accepts. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, you said the Jolly Boys didn't have a president. No, it won't take long to hold it in action. <laughs> <laughs> you send that telegram to Chicago and take the rest of the day off, Bessie. After all, it's Washington's birthday. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think I'll take the day off, too. 
is one president to another, I think I owe it to good old George. <laughs> That's right, Chief. I'll see you at the Jolly Boys meeting. Goodbye. Bum, bum, bum for president. Well, that takes care of everything. All five members will be there tonight. Hey, Al, can I go to Chicago with you?